Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Augustus, and I'm back again with another episode of Tsukihime. When we last left off, we had more conversations with Ark, learning a little bit more both about ourselves and about her. And in this episode, we should be reaching a dead end. As a matter of fact, we should be reaching a dead end very soon, and um, probably if I didn't sidebar so much in the last episode, I probably would have been able to reach that choice, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway... Without further waffling on, let's get back into it, shall we? Ah, suddenly, I feel a faint dizziness. Shiki, what's wrong? You're sweating an awful lot. No, it's just a twinge of pain in my head. I realize something with a shock as I reply to Arcoade. The window behind Arcoade. Beyond the glass, within the city street, still sunken in the darkness of night, a blue crow is looking in my direction. That's... I can do no more than stare at its dim figure through the window. Arcoade turns to the window, too. Turns towards the window, too. Fucking hell. I hate that name. Fucking hell. Um... Nervin skirt. No, um, I'm going to pronounce it like it's properly pronounced. Like this. Nervin's. You can't see my mouse. Nervin skirt. Mr. Uh, no nouns or no verbs. God, I'm tired. Uh, Mr. No verb name over here. That's pronounced Nero. His name is Nero Chaos. Yep, that's what you're supposed to get out of that. I don't remember if it tells you his last name is just Chaos in this. But his name is Nero. Yep, that's Nero. Yep, just drink it in. Look at that. N-R-V-N-Q-S-R. I think it's supposed to be something like 666666 or some shit like that. I don't, I don't know. It's dumb. It's a dumb name. Nero. Indeed. I have finally found you, princess of the true ancestors. From somewhere... A force of will flows into the room. Arcoade's eyes are full of enmity. Outside the window, the crow gives a loud, high-pitched scream. This is it. I am heading there right now. The blue crow flies off. All that remains is the dark of night and the white moon. Suddenly, boom! With a heavy noise, the room shakes violently. No, to be more precise, the entire hotel shook from that impact. The hell? I get up from the bed. Arcoade is silent, biting her lip with a vexed expression. Arcoade, shaking just now. She doesn't answer. Say something. That wasn't an earthquake, was it? If I had to guess, it felt more like someone had driven a large dump truck into the hotel lobby at full speed. It was that kind of impact. Arcoade. She doesn't answer. If I listen closely, I can hear noise from downstairs. Arcoade's face is grave. She said she was powerless right now. It's probably why she's not saying anything. Only time passes by. Two minutes. It's been two minutes after the impact, but the hotel is awfully quiet. Arcoade remains silent and still, just biting her lip as if withstanding something. I can see a trail of red blood slowly flowing down from her lip. Arcoade. Is she worried? Frustrated? She remains still, almost as if she's embracing herself, bearing with something. She said she wouldn't leave the room. Then, what am I here for? Ah, here we are. And this is where we get the chance for our next dead end. Yeah, it's probably a good thing I didn't do it because it's almost five minutes. Because uh -huh, I, I don't want videos to be over 30 minutes if I can help it. So, we are going to go for the bad end first. And we're going to stay in the room and keep watch. 
As long as Arcoid is unable to move, blindly going outside would be dangerous. Gripping the knife with one hand, I hold my breath. Arcoid is silent too. She looks like she's being careful of what's around her. The floor below is being noisy. Perhaps the shock woke up the guests and maybe they're complaining to the hotel people. It's still four in the morning, but even so, the noise is as loud as that of a festival. Even that falls silent a few minutes later. The noise disappears. A sickening silence. The lights go out. At the same time, the sound of countless things hitting the door. Are you prepared, Shiki? Arcoade whispers in the dark. Prepared for what? I don't even have to ask her. If remaining in here was a mistake, then that question was also a mistake. I turn towards the door at the sound of it breaking. No sound escapes from my mouth. As I turn around, bright white teeth fill my vision. Like a gentle maw capable of consuming me whole. Somehow, I'm able to calmly tell that it's the jaw. It's the jaws of a shark. Okay, I forgot about that. I forgot about this dude's powers for some reason. Because I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Fresh blood spills everywhere. With a thump, what remains of my body falls to the floor. What falls is my head. Everything below my face has been consumed in one bite. That is the last scene I ever see. End. Hooray. We've gotten another bad end, which means we get another one of the CL Sensei's lessons. You excited? I'm excited. I'm definitely excited. Want to see what she has to say about this? Bonjour. The corner is for the unlucky Tonokun who easily ended up in a dead end again. It is time for Teach Me CL Sensei. Now we will start with second period. This time we will present the first Snakes and Shivers Animal Land from the series that gives detailed observation of wild animals. Sensei, I have a question before that. That name sounds really stupid. In Japanese, you can read your name as Chiel. Question denied. Now then, Tonokun, I think it's good to be prudent, but this time, it seems to have backfired. Basically, you are a hero, so a little recklessness will be forgiven. It will be forgiven, but in a case with an absurd animal like a shark, I guess you could do much. We will just have to abandon Arcaway this time around. Hey, I don't want to hear that from Chiel. Abandon her. Kya, no violence. Anyhow, please prepare yourself to explore the hotel alone. Inside, you'll find a whole animal kingdom. As a representative of primates, let's show the beast what we've got. Yeah, uh, starting, uh, we gotta put down the Planet of the Apes before it even starts. I cannot remember the name of the prequel movie that came out however many years ago that was at this point. Uh, longer than I want to think about. So we're gonna load our save. And we'll do the smart thing and hold control instead of just skipping past text. And go check what's happening outside. Alright. I've decided what to do from the very beginning. Taking the knife out of my pocket, I walk up to the door. Shiki. I'm going to check things out. Don't leave this room until I come back. I step out into the hallway, shaking off Arcoid's look that she wants to say something. No one is in the hallway. I couldn't hear from inside, but the hallway is noisy. It's not that this floor is noisy. Rather, the noise is coming from beneath my feet. There is some kind of ruckus on the floor below. I can hear the noise of many people talking. Oh, um, I should point out, 
uh, there's another bad end coming up that I think I will try to show in the next round, um, but I don't think there's any way for me to get it this time without replaying everything so far. So, I will hopefully have it next time, or next, uh, next route, rather. Hopefully. I suppose the impact just woke the guests, and they are complaining to the hotel. It doesn't look strange so far. I walk down the hallway. The noise from downstairs is like the sound of ocean waves. Noisy, and yet so very solitary and inactive. My fingers gripping the knife feel numb. A chill runs over the back of my neck. There's something near my temple. Pain emerges from the back of my eyes. Enduring it, I walk down the hallway. It hurts. My eyes hurt. My head grows heavy and I feel a drifting sensation like I'm about to collapse right here. Yeah, I know what this is. Without a doubt, this is the feeling I get right before I collapse from anemia. Uh, uh, it hurts. It hurts. Unable to withstand it any longer, I remove my glasses. I can see the elevator. A long hallway. It must be more than 10 meters from here to the elevator. And then, with a ding-dong, the elevator comes up to the 11th floor. I can see the lines on the elevator door. No, they are... They're too dense. They look almost pitch black. The door opens. The small steel box opens. Inside that box, crammed to the point of overflowing, is human flesh. Inside that steel box called an elevator, the red meat of humans is ground and pushed in. Inside, two black dogs are voraciously feasting away on something. What? I stop breathing. Like my brain just froze, my lungs stop as well. I can't breathe. But that isn't important. My vision turns crimson. With a babbling sound, blood pours out of the elevator with a bubbling sound. Amidst the ocean of blood, people, arms, feet, bones, brains, fingers, organs, and other parts, the two black dogs are the only form of life. My very instincts refuse to take in this scene. Down the hallway, two black dogs are picking at the human corpses. If I listen carefully, I can still hear sounds coming from downstairs. If I listen carefully, they are the sounds of gorging, the chewing of meat, cries for help, and the death screams of people who can't even be called words anymore. What is this? Though there is no way I can see it, before my eyes is the image of a dozen beasts eating the people in the hotel alive. A man running down the hallway trying to escape. But the panther-like claws descend from the ceiling, slice him open from his nose to the back of his head. A girl looking her locking herself up in a room and crying. But to the lions, a door is no stronger than paper, and within seconds, they demolish it into an unrecognizable shape. Striving madly to be the first ones there, people dashing for the elevator. But within, the black dogs waiting inside decapitate them the instant the door opens. At any rate, there is no exception. Beneath my feet, within this huge box called the hotel, is a scene from hell I can feel down to my very bones. I feel like throwing up, but I can't do that. If I just stand around and do that, I'll become part of that Red Sea. I resume my breathing. I grit my teeth hard. 
The dogs inside the elevator notice me. All sounds from below have ceased. Uh, in other words, there is no longer anyone alive. The black dogs begin to run. Of course, towards the elevator, the last prey. Uh, uh, the black dog is coming for me. On their bodies, I can see an infinite number of lines, and on their forehead, the point of death. But even so, my paralyzed mind does not order my body to fight or run. The first black dog leaps. Its speed belies all human comparison. It doesn't even take two seconds to cover the ten meters down the hallway. They open their mouths. Mouse filled with fangs so many sh times sharper than the knife I have, and they are aimed straight at my throat. Accurate and fast. The instant I realize they are drawing upon me, the fangs bite into my throat with a crunch. I die. But that's not right. I can't be killed by something like this, and I refuse to die. The deaths of others would not cause me to hesitate. A hot summer's day. It happened long ago, eight years ago. I've seen something even more terrible. Thrust. I thrust my knife into the forehead of the black dog biting into my neck. My arm moved just before the black dog ripped through my throat. It was done so perfectly, even for myself. Like a machine whose sole purpose, whose sole function is to cut, I plunged the knife into the dog's forehead without any useless and wasted movement. Because that's where the first dog's point was. Normally, even if the brain is destroyed, the muscles try to execute the command they have received from the brain. The black dog probably would have probably ripped through my throat, even if I had simply pierced its head. Ah, blah, blah, blah. Flub, 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 flub. Well, normally that would happen. But the black dog is dead. Death is a complete stoppage. At the point when I killed it, it lost even every form of validity. The first dog falls onto the ground. In its place, the second dog flying straight at my face. I thrust the knife right into its open mouth, but that was a mistake. The dog's point is not even on its face, but on its chest. Just stabbing it in its mouth will not kill it. The knife pierces through the dog's mouth and into the back of its head. Naturally, the hand holding the knife still remains in the dog's mouth. Ah, the black dog is still alive. Its jaw shuts. The point between my arm and the hand holding the knife is bitten, about to be ripped apart. Proper thought returns with the pain. Uh, uh, you have to be kidding me. It, it's just as if I'm just letting him chew through my arm by stabbing him in the mouth. I, you, I try to pull my arm out. The dog's teeth are deep in my arm. It doesn't seem like I can pull it off. More importantly, this dog, despite having pierced in it, having been pierced in the head, is still filled with life. Even though I lift after piercing its head, it shakes and lands on top of me. Go! I fall onto the floor. I still can't pull my arm out. The black dog, still pierced in the head, applies more power to its bite. My arm is surely going to be torn off. I can't believe this. No dog ought to be able to bite anything in that state. You. I feel something wet. I can see blood spilling from the black dog's mouth. Is it the black dog's blood leaking from its wound, knife wound to the head? Or is the blood coming from my arm about to be torn off? To be honest... My head is too messed up to be feeling the pain, so it isn't a big deal which one it is. Let go! Trying to wrestle away from the black dog, 
but it is firmly attached to my arm. I can't escape. I can't run away. If I want to escape, I have no choice but to kill it. But how? The hand it's biting off is the one holding the knife. I'm on the ground, so even if I did pull my hand out, the very next instant the black dog's mouth will be free to bite through my throat. Ah, ah, it's okay. Calm down, Shiki. First, you've got to examine the situation and then think calmly about it. That's the kind of thinking you've always kept. In that case, I can do something. For example, there's plenty of lines on the back of its head. And I can see the black point on its chest. The way to survive is awfully simple. But I have my doubts about executing the plan. No matter how savage and evil a creature it is, to do something like painting and gasping creature and to do something like kill a panting and gasping creature that's so alive, that's so cl that's close to me, it's something I'm hesitate am hesitant to do. G the pressure on my arm increases. My entire arm is shortly going to be ripped off at this rate. But even so, I just can't do something so cruel. And I think this is where I'm going to end the episode. I'm uh, apparently can't read. It's not super, super early, but still uh, a little bit earlier than normal. I just bought my microphone a bit. Um, but even still, since I can't read, I'd rather... I, since apparently I can't read even worse than normal, uh, I just, I'm going to end it here. So, will Shiki be able to execute his plan? What happens with silly named person who... I just don't want to have to read his name again because I have to remember not to call him, not to try to pronounce the amalgamation of vowelless of a, ah, just thinking about it is giving me a headache well we will absolutely see more of him and his dumb name next time and I hope to see you all there